Today our session is on the topic Instability in Myanmar, Implications for Bangladesh and the Region in collaboration with Beeps and Dhaka Tribune. The moderators are Major General Amy Munirud Zaman, <coughs> President of Beeps, and Mr. Zafar Subhan, Editor of Dhaka Tribune. I would like to uh, request the moderators to carry on the rest of the session. Thank you very much. Thank you. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, assalamu alaikum and a very good morning to all of you after last night's cyclone. Thankfully, the weather has cleared and we are set to start a very interesting session today talking about issues in Myanmar and how those internal issues in Myanmar might affect Bangladesh and the region as a whole. Myanmar is Bangladesh's only other neighbor except India. A country as big as Myanmar, resourceful, populated, but yet it has been in trouble for many years and decades. Recently, after the Rohingya refugee migration or influx to Bangladesh, the events have even unfolded in Myanmar in a very negative manner. Especially after the February 21 coup in that country, the country has become unstable with a number of issues which are unfolding and in a dynamic manner. Myanmar is extremely multi-ethnic and the different regions have different agendas and aspirations. As a matter of fact, there are currently 13 ongoing insurgencies going on in that country. All of them are active insurgencies. There are over 12 to 15 various insurgent groups that are fighting the Myanmar state and the Myanmar army of the Takmado. So all these inner instability and infighting has consequences beyond the borders of Myanmar, in particular towards Bangladesh border. The Bangladesh border with Myanmar has been unstable for many years now. Especially the events in the Rakhine state has direct consequences on Bangladesh. Of late, we see a renewed activity of Arakan army in the Rakhine state. The Arakan army, which primarily started operating in 2009, in the Kachin state and then got trained by the Kachin Independent Army or KIA has then moved to Rakhine to operate in that country and are claiming an independent space for themselves in the Rakhine state. That has now brought about the Takmado into a major operation in the Rakhine state. Quite often that operation is crisscrossing the Bangladesh border in terms of firepower and in terms of airspace violation. It is important for us to understand the strategic significance of Rakhine when we discuss the events in that state of Myanmar and how it affects Bangladesh. The Rakhine state is geostrategically, geoeconomically, and geoenergy-wise extremely important to a number of major powers. It is in this state that China has now built the deep seaport in Chakpu. And Chakpu is not only a port, it is a major energy hub for China. It is also pumping out sweet gas in the same region and piping it back to Yunnan. It also has refineries in plan in the same space. There are special economic zones of China being built in the Rakhine State. For China, this is a major energy hub. And it also gives them the ability to bypass the energy security that emanates out of the Malacca Straits Passage. 
There are similar Indian interests in the Rakhine State by the Indians because they are in the process of completing the Kaladan multimodal highway from Sitwe port back into the Indian Northeast. Half of the highway has now been built and it's a major strategic interest for the Indians. The Russians are now also eyeing at building several special economic zone in the Rakhine state. So all three states which are closely associated with the Myanmar government and the Takmado are Indians, the Russians, and the Chinese. So you can imagine what sort of great power interest is coming into Myanmar and in particular to the Rakhine state. Although Myanmar is our neighbor, and the only other neighbor, as I said, except India. But it is also the neighbor which is least understood by Bangladesh side. It is in my appreciation and understanding that we have not engaged them sufficiently, historically, although it's a close neighbor. And since the complications of the Rohingya refugees being housed in Bangladesh, and the military coup that took place in February 2021, we are now in a state of relationship where there is very little contact with Myanmar. It also worries me that we have very little contact at the track one level, and there is no contact at the track two level. So all sorts of communication and contact with Myanmar has now been stalled. And that is not a happy situation for any bilateral relationship. So there is a plenty to discuss on the various aspects and the dynamics of the events in Myanmar and our bilateral relationship and the regional consequences. We have an excellent panel to discuss this today. And at least one of our panelists has ground experience of having lived and worked in Myanmar for many years. So therefore, I would like to go straight to our panels today to start the discussion. Each of the panelists will take about 10 to 15 minutes to give the deliberations. Then we open the floor for an open floor discussion. So with that very brief introduction, I will now turn to Major General Mohammad Shahid al Haq, who was a former defense attaché in Myanmar and also a former ambassador to Libya. Shahid, you have the floor. Thank you very much, sir. Good morning, gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, uh, I'll start with the uh, Myanmar uh, topic, especially I'll be touching upon, uh, uh, I'll rather introduce you what is Myanmar. Then I'll uh, touch upon the military side. Then finally, why Myanmar is so important in 21st century. This is the subject I'm going to cover. First of all, in 2012, one of the Myanmar ambassadors complained to me that Bangladesh looks east beyond Myanmar. In a sense, he's right. And also right that Bangladesh doesn't exist in Myanmar periphery. So before I actually go into the, uh, my subject, uh, which I'm going to describe, we have to understand the Myanmar's pushes and pulls before coming to into a uh, conclusive conclusion. Myanmar is a very complex country, as is history. Myanmar is composed of many nationalities, rather some of the independent countries before British arrived. Rather, after 1948, before, uh, during the uh, independence, these, all the nationalities were forced into one nation. That is what, what is called today's Myanmar. In fact, there is no change since 1948. It used to be ruled by major ethnic group, which, is, which we, call, we call Bamars, uh, like Aung San Suu Kyi's uh, ethnic group. They are the one. They are the one who is controlling everything under the sun in Myanmar since 1948. In fact, Myanmar never saw peace. The only in peace in the history, in, in its hundreds of years of history, the only time it has actually seen peace and enjoyed peace was during British colonial time. Otherwise, it is always at war during in kings, 
king, uh, kingships and of course after 48. In fact, Myanmar is uh, constantly at war with, it, with its bordering states, especially the ethnic group which, is, uh, which are residing in all the borders, less the central plain. I'll come, come uh, later on, what, what, what do I mean by central plain? In 1948, just before, uh, um, in 1946, just before the independence, in 1948, Jan Ansan, He's, uh, he's the father of uh, um, Aung San Suu Kyi. He, uh, he had an idea that uh, why not, whatever the Myanmar, British Myanmar at that time, why not we uh, form a single country and we stay there for 10 years. If we don't like it, then we go away. This is the one we, you must have heard that Panglong Peace Treaty or Panglong uh, Dialogue, which is uh, very popularly known around the world, which Aung San Suu Kyi also tried after coming to power in 2014. Unfortunately, uh, Jan, uh, Aung San was killed before 1948, and things went back to square one where it was. The Bamas still, uh, they were ruling, and they had been ruling since 1948 without implementing the famous Panglong uh, uh, Agreement. To be told that Myanmar was never integrated into a one nation. As I was saying, not only it was not integrated in one nation, but there is a term which is very popular in Myanmar, also uh, some of the scholars outside, Burmanization. Everything they do is Burmanization. And what does it mean? It means you as an ethnic group or those who had been a country before British arrived, they cannot claim their culture, they claim cannot claim their history. And this is the root cause of all the instability and the fighting with this one. Like, let's say, example, with Arakan. Arakan had been an independent country for a long time, till 18th century, early 18th century. In, at that time, Burmese king captured Arakan, and the rest is history, you know. But at this moment, Arakanis, they cannot claim that they were an independent country. Neither they claim they can claim they have got a separate culture. Neither they can claim they have got a different line of Buddhism in in Arakan. So this is what is called Burmanization, and this is the exactly what is happening in uh, Myanmar. In fact, another thing will happen for the last two decades plus that Myanmar hasn't seen any major fighting. Less 2012. It doesn't mean that Myanmar is at peace. It means Myanmar government has uh, undergone a major uh, political and strategic decision. They, what they have done, they have given concession to these, all those major insurgent groups. In that concession, what is done, these insurgent groups, they can, uh, what is it called, they can do business, they have got power plant, they run big casinos, they do the drug business, and they, some of them have got weapon factories, and what not. I mean, totally, it is everything they do. Only thing is that they, they remain within the union of Burma. So with that one, that's how it is maintained a peace since 2001. Also, it uh, doesn't mean that these, all the ethnic groups, they have disbanded themselves. As um, uh, Sar was saying that 12 to, uh, um, around 12 to 13 insurgents. In fact, all the insurgents groups are there. They are updating their weapons. They have modernized, and some of them have got weapon factory in their areas. Also, they have got APCs. They just they don't have aircraft. Otherwise, everything they have got. So uh, it is there, but this is a very uneasy peace at that moment in, 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 in Myanmar. That another one is very popular in democratization in Myanmar. I call it it's a myth. Why? Because if you look at the constitution of 2008, this is a constitution of exclusion. It is not encompassing all the ethnic group or all the, all everybody in the in the society. Let's say, I'll give you one example. It is designed to exclude Aung San Suu Kyi from to be a, from being a president of the country. There's a special clause and sub clause in there. So, as I was saying this, whatever we saw the transition to the Myanmar. Uh, I mean, where everybody had been celebrating that. Okay, she's a de facto leader and all those. 
I can assure you those are a myth. I mean, later on, since subject is very vast, I might uh, didn't cause question answers and why I call it myth. She actually didn't have any power to do, but yes, she is being propagated as being a power over there. So, by the way, it's un very unfortunate to say that Aung San Suu Kyi is also not a Democrat. She is as hateful as Bamar as anybody on the street of Yangon. So this is a very, um, I mean, very unfortunate. You can see what happened after 2014 till she was ousted uh, last year. It's ironic that West and US, they, they do not see beyond Aung San Suu Kyi. I repeat the word, US, Britain, and some of his allies, they don't see beyond Aung San Suu Kyi. That's the problem. And this is the one which is prolonging the suffering of Myanmar people. Now let's come to the ethnic group. There are 135 ethnic groups in Myanmar officially recognized by Myanmar government as part of the constitution. And unfortunately, in reality, there are more. At one time, they had 148 ethnic groups. But they, as I was saying, the things are they in Myanmar for exclusion. While the rules and regulations are made for exclusion, not for inclusion. In, in that uh, ethnic group, Bamal's, Aung San Suu Kyi's uh, ethnic group, they are 68%, Shan is 9%, and others are chronologically over there. At this moment, there are 800,000 Rohingyas inside Myanmar. And outside Myanmar, about 2 million. This calculation is mine because 1 million is here. In the in, 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 in 70s, we gave a visa to 250,000 um, Rohingyas. Uh, and also, Pakistan also gave 250,000. So it is a, about 500,000. I and mean, if you add, add plus minus 200, uh, sorry, 2 million Rohingyas are outside Myanmar. Now let's come to the leadership. It's very unfortunate since other than Aung San Suu Kyi as a civilian, there is no leadership group or there at this moment in Myanmar. After Aung San Suu Kyi, who is next? Unfortunately, nobody knows. Next is religion. That's a very interesting. In Myanmar, a, a proverb is said, it, it is in, in, in vogue for about more than thousands of years, it is said, to be a Burmese, to be a Buddhist. That is, you have to be Buddhist to be call yourself as a Burmese. And in fact, this is, it was coined in, in uh, 1044 by one of the kings. So you can very uh, well, well understand what does it mean, that there is uh, hardly any space for other people. Myanmar, <coughs> they follow Theravada Buddhism. This is one of the southern sect of Buddhism. It is kind of uh, strict, uh, what is that called, uh, orthodox uh, Buddhism, though this is a little bit uh, different from the Pali. So, I mean, all in the southern portion from Sri Lanka to uh, Myanmar and up to a uh, little bit uh, Japan, they all follow southern portion of the uh, southern sect of Buddhism, that which is we call Theravadi Buddhism. <coughs> Myanmar also for Myanmar is. They also follow religiously numerology and astrology. And there is a government appointment, uh, appointed astrologist who actually need, you, who is consulted before any major decision taken in Myan by the Myanmar government. Like, I'll give one example. When to release Aung San Suu Kyi from the jail? This was also consulted. Number one, when to hold held election in 2011? That was also consulted. By, uh, with the uh, astrologist. When to move capital from Yangon to uh, Nepido, that was also consultation uh, with the uh, uh, with astrologists. So these are the lots of things uh, there. Also, they are very, very superstitious. I'll give you an example. In 1987, just because of the one simple decision based on superstition, is it has destroyed the whole Myanmar economy. and effect is being felt till today. Nguyen, at that time Nguyen was in power. Somebody, <coughs> one of the monks said, 
<coughs> that we have got 10 or 50 charts, 100 charts. Wherever there is a zero in the notes, these are considered as bad luck. So what to do? So you introduce those notes which is divisive by nine. So what he did? He introduced 45 chart and 90 chart notes. You will find in Yangon Street these charts being sold as a souvenirs. So this is what, and that destruction of the economy is being felt till today in Myanmar. They are also very superstitious. And especially another one incident which need to be told, that driving from the right side of the road or left side of the road is also, dis I mean, based on the superstitions. Somebody told Neville in 1974 that driving on the left side is bad omen. So what he did overnight, he said, okay, we'll drive from the right side. And that's what the chaos in, in Myanmar. Myanmar, you find cars are right hand driving, driven, but they drive on the right side. And it's including the receiving porches are also the way we do on the left side of driving. So uh, this is what it is about superstition. Another superstition which is related to us is that white elephant. All of you know that, um, I don't know, uh, you may know it, that white elephant, I mean whitish elephant, is only available in Bandarbon of Bangladesh. But at one time it used to be, uh, this, uh, is, uh, uh, it used to grace till uh, Thailand. So in their mythology it is said that a, any king or any ruler who finds out a white elephant in their uh, rule, it, it is a bad luck, uh, bad, uh, sorry, it's a good luck. So what he did in 19, uh, 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 just before uh, Jan Thanshwe left, he paid some purchase in Bangabon, 50 lakhs taka, to drive the hordes to the Myanmar side. There he paid another lakhs of charts to uh, Myanmar's uh, holders, uh, um, purchase. Uh, what they did, they caught two to three uh, elephant, white elephants, and they took them, carried them, all the way to Yangon, spending millions of dollars and uh, deputing one left hand journal to do that. Uh, if you go to the Napito, you'll find those two elephants, white elephants, in, inside one of the pagodas. So, uh, in, in, in superstition, uh, having said that one, now I'll touch upon the military. Military is all powerful. Uh, I'll just quickly uh, run down about this one. Uh, it's all powerful institution. It has got five command, uh, 20, 14 regional command, like, uh, uh, like corps in our army, and it has got uh, 20 light infantry divisions, divisions, and also other regional commands. But in, in one nutshell, I'll say that uh, Myanmar military is designed to fight its insurgency, not the uh, external threat. The only external threat it has recognized in their paper is the, they call it nearest to enemy, is, is historical for Thailand. Otherwise, in case of Bangladesh, they don't consider uh, Bangladesh as their enemy by seeing their concept, by seeing their deployment, and that's by seeing their uh, uh, employment of their weapons and other things. And also the Myanmar use one of the most dreaded uh, concept of war, of insurgency, counterinsurgency, is they call it four cuts. And four cuts is, you know, uh, they supply the food, funds, and recruits, and information uh, to the resistance group. And with that one, by for doing this one, they actually follow the scorch art policy. They burn down everything. Just uh, uh, they, yesterday also, you must have seen that in the news, 50 uh, Myanmar is also killed in that, uh, in that attack. In my assessment, military assessment, if I say that Myanmar is a severely under strength and also equipped. It is not designed to take any external uh, threat. Yes, it might introduce it in Bangladesh, but it cannot sustain its operation. The depth of the operation is limited to battalion level, that is one to two kilometers. But beyond that, it cannot operate. Then second one is under equipment. It is highly under equipped. I mean, is a, uh, rather uh, it cannot sustain itself in the fighting. Having said that, I'll just uh, can I take sir, five one minutes? Minute. One minute. One minute, right, sir. 
Um, importance of Myanmar, I just uh, touch upon this one. Uh, today in uh, 21st century, thanks to, I'll say, the Americans, had they uh, been careful in 1996, uh, they could have uh, stopped the rise of China. And with the rise of China, we can see that in 21st century, the importance of Myanmar, as I can show, I, you can see on the map, map the, all the routes and roads and energy hubs passes through Myanmar. In fact, Myanmar has given the breathing space to India and China. Uh, for India, they, can, they have uh, right to bypass the chicken neck, which is called Shinikuri Corridor. And for China, they have given uh, breathing space to uh, alternative to Malacca Strait by passing, um, having a link from Chak to, to Yunnan, a direct link where gas and um, oil, which is already operational, they are going to build, um, they are going to build the railway, roads, and a lot of other uh, uh, system. So um, I'll st end over here. Uh, if you have got doubt, <coughs> maybe we'll discuss it uh, during the question answer session. Thank you very much. Thank you, Shai, for giving us an insight into the very complex nature of the Myanmar state and the Myanmar societies. It is an unique state. It operates in, in a very different manner than the conventional functioning of any other state, not only from the religious point of view, from the point of view of the tremendous role of astrologers and astrology in that country, and also a very concocted history that they have in, inherited in that country. So we will have sufficient time to discuss all these in our Q&A session. I shall now turn to our next speaker, and she's Umme Salma Tarin, an assistant professor of the Department of International Relations in the Bangladesh University of Professionals. So Tarin, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, everyone, for coming. A uh, very good morning to you all. Um, uh, as we have already uh, heard uh, uh, some aspects uh, regarding the military junta of Myanmar, now uh, I'd like to highlight upon some uh, some key aspects of national unity government, um, which we need to discuss uh, as part of the current crisis because uh, that that particular uh, entity is uh, currently uh, uh, one of the major stakeholders in this crisis, and also. Uh, we need to understand what kind of support uh, that particular entity is having uh, internationally or uh, inside Myanmar and what are their strategies and uh, and also uh, I'll be highlighting uh, upon uh, what kind of support or role big powers, uh, that means essentially the regional powers are playing uh, in this particular crisis. Uh, and because understanding the support or uh, the, the uh, uh, nature of uh, attention they are giving towards this crisis or offering towards this crisis is is key to understand uh, uh, our approach to, uh, regarding with regard to this crisis because uh, we cannot just think about Myanmar and Bangladesh we need to think about Myanmar from the uh, geopolitical point of view. Uh, so, uh, if we talk about a national unity government, uh, we, we probably know that it, it was formed in 2021, uh, just immediately after the coup uh, in April 2021, and uh, their objective uh, was primarily to um, uh, to check or to challenge the military from having overall control or total control of the uh, territories in Myanmar. The goal was. Um, or has been to establish a federal union, uh, although this is a very high ambitious goal for NUG, but uh, uh, they're trying to include uh, stakeholders from civil societies, community leaders, and uh, most of these members of NUG are from uh, the NLD, uh, are uh, were, uh, working under NLD. Uh, 
And also, they're trying to project responsible governance. They have established their Ministry of Defense, their Ministry of Commerce, their Ministry of Health. And they have been trying to do a lot of things. For example, COVID-19 task force was formed by them. And they tried to uh, offer vaccination to people who were, uh, uh, I mean, uh, who, uh, I mean, anti anti group. Uh, those people are offered uh, vaccines and uh, other uh, essential health support by uh, this particular uh, uh, national entity government. And mostly the most important goal or objective right now for NUG, I think, is uh, gaining international support or recognition because they are uh, trying heart and soul uh, to gain that recognition from different international uh, 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 I mean, uh, communities, including states and uh, uh, international organizations. So this NUG, uh, one of the major aspects is they have uh, formed the People's Defensive Force. Uh, under which different uh, local defense uh, organizations who are mostly autonomous and also there are some uh, uh, groups who are working under NUG's uh, Ministry of Defense. So People's Defensive Force is, uh, uh, we basically refer uh, to it as the, uh, I mean, a uh, group of uh, all the uh, uh, parties who are fighting against uh, Janta in uh, Myanmar right now. Uh, um, and uh, they have also tried to form a central common coordinating co coordinate committee, but uh, a lot of work remains to be seen in, in that case because uh, as we have heard, Myanmar is a very dynamic space and there has been so many insurgency groups, so many ethnic armed groups. So bringing all of them under a common people's defensive force is really a tough task to do and um, the success uh, is still remains to be seen because uh, the common structure, uh, I mean, uh, this committee is not actually working or uh, coordinating all these things, all these groups is a big uh, challenge for national unity government. And that's why, uh, although a recent um, special security, uh, special advisory committee uh, for Myanmar, which was comprised of uh, uh, human rights officials, uh, former human rights officials of UN, they have recently um, uh, came out with a brief about Myanmar and they are taking, uh, telling that um, things are already shaping in Myanmar, inside Myanmar and the international community should uh, uh, recognize this NUG as soon as possible and they are, they are saying that um, already uh, uh, more than 50% territories are under NUG and only 17% of territories are being um, uh, governed by, uh, successfully or effectively being governed by uh, Tatmadaw. Uh, uh, although we don't know what is actually happening uh, exactly in that, uh, I mean, in the conflict zone, but still, uh, the the very recent report which came in September 5th, I think it gives a lot of hope as well. Uh, it, it adds new uh, dimension to the uh, war. And uh, uh, since this particular committee is uh, giving this data, and it shows that uh, although initially uh, the NEG has faced uh, a lot of uh, problems and still they have a lot of problems which you got to common uh, um, control structure and also coordinating all the ethnic armed groups who have divergence of um, objectives and uh, uh, targets or uh, uh, strategies. So uh, still they have a lot of things to do and but but uh, uh, I think uh, uh, a to, to, to some extent they have gained success in controlling some territories or uh, uh, a lot of territories uh, in Myanmar. And uh, in terms of its recognition, I think uh, 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 one of the major success of uh, NUG in terms of international recognition, um, uh, I think uh, so far no countries are trying to, uh, no country is trying to recognize uh, them explicitly or officially, but uh, overtly, uh, or overtly many countries are trying to support them. Uh, very recently, European Union 
Indigenous Parliament has uh, told that they are going to support uh, uh, national unity government. But uh, even uh, USA, the National Security Advisor, uh, Jack Sullivan, he met with uh, uh, NUG and uh, different other countries are also having uh, online and offline uh, different types of uh, 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 meetings with NUG. But still, we don't see a lot of uh, hope with regard to um, uh, recognizing uh, NUG uh, very explicitly. And I think uh, because of these developments, we are yet to see what is going to happen, whether NUG is really going to take over a lot of territories from Myanmar and going to take over the government. Uh, I think the international community is behaving in a very strategic way because they, they also don't know what is going to happen in near future. So they're trying to be also very calculative about uh, the coming, about, about the government, selecting or recognizing the government uh, in Myanmar, although most of them are are right now uh, definitely supporting or uh, recognizing uh, this particular Tatmadaw um, government. Um, in terms of regional stability, uh, uh, I think uh, definitely if uh, Myanmar has been one of the most uh, destabilizing factor in uh, Southeast Asia and also in this uh, region um, because it affects also India, Bangladesh. Um, uh, in terms of uh, instability, I think uh, it's not only Bangladesh who has been uh, facing the consequences of uh, the crisis in Myanmar, rather Thailand. Several times uh, Myanmar has violated the airspace of Thailand as well. Um, and also uh, they fired uh, the artillerists there and also uh, people, uh, people are killed in, in Thailand also. And uh, in case of India, we see recently, uh, in, uh, I mean, in 2021, 16,000, around 16,000 people migrated uh, to India uh, because of uh, the conflict between Tatmadar and different insurgency groups. So uh, it has also created a tension within Indian government. And although they have successfully sealed their uh, border and they follow basically the policy of identify um, uh, uh, detain and deport. So they have successfully sealed their uh, entry points and uh, for them probably it is not creating a lot of uh, consequences. But still, if uh, this conflict continues or uh, if or this, uh, um, if, uh, I mean, uh, the, the insurgency groups in, uh, in, in Northeast India, uh, these groups, uh, previously India government and uh, the military junta in Myanmar, they used to uh, uh, fight counter operations together. Uh, and also India got a lot of support from Myanmar in, in fighting their northeastern um, uh, insurgent groups. But uh, if uh, uh, right now the military is trying to use those northeastern insurgent groups uh, against the anti Janta forces. So that can accelerate or that can intensify the uh, insurgency movements which are going on in Northeast India. So for India, that can also create a very uh, that can be the, the conflict can be a very destabilizing factor. Although India is not, I mean, uh, not very concerned about those aspects, rather it, it is trying to focus more on its uh, other goals like geopolitical goals and its competition with China. Uh, I'll try to cover those uh, just a few minutes uh, later. And uh, uh, also, China is also facing, uh, uh, I mean, the consequences of this uh, crisis, I think, because. Uh, a lot of people are moving to the Yunnan province as well, and also uh, uh, due to this crisis, there are uh, militias, fight between militias, uh, uh, drug cartels, uh, military. Uh, so everyone is trying to gain control of territories uh, and resources uh, across China, uh, Myanmar border as well. Uh, and there are some groups in uh, that area, for example, United Wa State Army, so uh, which was being supported by China for a long time, and uh, uh, now the military do not want to uh, give them their uh, special administrative rights, and that's how the border uh, in China and Myanmar is also becoming unstable. And. 
so in terms of instability, I think uh, uh, this particular uh, issue, uh, not only the refugee crisis, but also uh, a lot of small arms and a lot of drugs are entering into Myanmar. So as a whole, uh, it, it affects the regional stability, I think. And uh, uh, the big powers, I think uh, we cannot just do uh, whatever we want to do uh, with regard to Myanmar. Uh, we cannot be driven by emotional uh, interests or emotional uh, 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 drives because we need to think about the geopolitical realities. There is China and India and uh, who are uh, uh, on two sides of Myanmar. and. China uh, is a big power, and China have uh, a lot of interest within uh, Myanmar. So uh, China, uh, although uh, when Aung San Suu Kyi government came to power, then China uh, found it very difficult to, uh, uh, to to get aligned with Myanmar because the government was more aligned to the West, uh, the Myanmar government. But when the 2017 refugee crisis occurred, that time China took it as an opportunity to go to, uh, I mean, to go uh, uh, with a friendly gesture towards Myanmar, and then uh, they initiated uh, the uh, China-Myanmar Economic Corridor project. And also, uh, China has significant interest in Myanmar because uh, China considers Myanmar as its uh, West Coast dream, or China has this West Coast dream where they see uh, the Chakpi uh, port as a very essential uh, port for accessing their um, uh, Indian Ocean and also for accessing uh, the Pacific and also to use it as an alternative to the Malacca Strait, which is uh, sometimes uh, dominated by uh, US, uh, US military. And also so uh, through this port, they can ensure their naval, uh, I mean their navy's presence in the Indian Ocean, um, and also uh, uh, one of the China's major uh, geopolitical goal here is keeping United States away from this region. For China, China has been always telling that this is a nation problem, and we should try to solve it. Uh, within Asia, with Asian power, so uh, that is another issue that China never wants. Uh, China, China wants to have as much as control over this territory. And with regard to India, as I already mentioned, that uh, the northeastern region that might become more unstable uh, due to this crisis. So that is one issue, and most important issue, I think, from geopolitical perspective, is the rivalry with China and the competition with China. As China is trying to increase its infrastructure presence and its uh, uh, control over this particular region, India is also trying to uh, uh, compete over there. And they have invested significantly in the Kaladan multimodal uh, transit uh, transport and um, uh, although the process uh, I mean although the construction of these uh, particular uh, uh, project is not uh, uh, going the way they wanted but still uh, although slow but uh, this is a, a major development for India China relation and also India has the leverage I think uh, to work as a mediator between uh, 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 the Western community and Myanmar because Myanmar economy you know, has shrunk over uh, last year for uh, 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 I mean up to 18 uh, percent so and also they have been facing the consequences of sanctions and uh, development assistance are reducing so uh, probably India will try also to use that opportunity to work as a mediator between um, uh, Myanmar and also uh, the Western government uh, Western uh, community uh, can I take two few mi two minutes <laughs> OK. Uh, uh, all right. Uh, thank you, everyone. I'll be happy to answer any questions with regard to what should Bangladesh do or uh, other things. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Tarun. You touched upon the issues of energy. As we analyze, we see that energy has not been able to consolidate its base and power that was expected. But what is interesting is that the PDF is now getting into agreements with several of these insurgent groups. And the PDF and the insurgent groups, in some cases, are fighting a joint battle against the Takmado. But on the downside, the PDF is fractured. So there is hardly any PDF unity that we see across Myanmar. But it is absolutely essential for us to understand and identify that Myanmar is in a 
all these 10 years of civil war, especially because of the inclusion of PDF. So with that kind of a civil war, we can expect and we should be prepared that there could be an influx of conflict refugees out of Myanmar. We should also be prepared that we can have a second wave of Rohingya refugees being thrown out of Myanmar. And the likely destination will be Bangladesh again. So a combination of second wave of Rohingya refugees heading towards Bangladesh and a potential conflict refugees again heading out of Myanmar is a serious problem that we should be all considering and be prepared to cope with. So those are the flashpoints we should be prepared to identify and be prepared for. We also see that Myanmar is an extremely resourceful country. It may be the most resourceful country in the region. And therefore, many of the internal conflicts that we see within Myanmar is also related to resources. So there is a fair amount of warlordism that goes on in the various states and the insurgencies. We see, for example, the Shan state, and with the Shan state army, it is almost a state within a state because it controls the resources of that state. Myanmar currently is under severe sanctions by the West. That is taking a fair amount of economic bite within the internal economy of the country. And therefore, the internal economic turmoil or the instability might also send out economic migrants out of that country. To discuss the economic aspects and the various issues of economic instability and the allied issues, we now have Pervez Karim Mabasi, Assistant Professor of the Department of Economics of the East West University, giving us his thoughts. So Pervez, you have the floor, please. Thank you, sir. And good morning to the single audience. Uh, it falls on my lot to discuss about boring issues. So again, but let me give you an itinerary of what I'm going to discuss today. Number one, a brief snapshot of the economy of Myanmar, especially post-coup of February 2021. Number two, the economy of Tatmadaw, which is more important. Number three, and I'll explain why. Number three, the narcotic space economy. <coughs> Number four, a brief peek into sanctions and its efficacy. Number five, the economic war, which is waged by the various insurgents in Myanmar. And if I get the time, number six, the rare earth calculus in Myanmar. So here we go. Uh, it doesn't take any rocket science to say that Myanmar is facing severe economic stress. But then again, which country isn't? Ranging from Germany all the way to United Kingdom to poor old Bangladesh. Everybody is facing a crisis. But Myanmar has a different complexity to its problem. And its, situ its crisis has been exacerbated by the double blow of COVID-19 and the Russia-Ukraine conflict. And along with this, the instability that has been generated because of the coup that has taken place in February 2021. Let me give you a few facts and figures. GDP in 2019 per capita was $1,400. And Myanmar was making rapid strides because as many of the speakers have indicated, Myanmar is rich in resources. And it was almost double the figure that it was in 2008. And it was expected that it would catch up with its ASEAN peers within a couple of, or at least within a decade or so. However, and poverty rate was down to 25%. So things were looking sunny. After the coup, because of the crisis, the infighting that has taken place with the NUG and its PDFs, the People's Defense Forces, and the various ethnic armed organizations, namely the Arakan Army, the Kia, and other groups that you have in the Chin State. Right now, in 2021, Myanmar has had the worst recession recorded globally. 
whereby its economy contracted by 18%. Poverty rates are again have jumped up to 40%. Vaccination, in terms of COVID-19 vaccination, Myanmar has the lowest record amongst ASEAN countries at 40%. This only goes to show the level of instability that is breeding on. You have a range of low intensity armed conflicts almost verging on open civil war. And that has had a massive impact on the economy. Add to this, the sanctions by the West led by the United States of America, United Kingdom, uh, Australia, and later on European Union, all together in a, according in concert which has these targeted sanctions has hit military-owned enterprises, which is basically the backbench or which is the cornerstone of Myanmar's economy. If I just give you a few numbers, inflation last year was around 18% in Myanmar. The Myanmar's currency, the kiak, has depreciated by 30%. There are three exchange rates in Myanmar. One is the official exchange rate, one is the informal exchange rate, another one is the Facebook exchange rate. But the informal exchange rate, which is a rough indicator, is one US dollar is equal to 4,500 to 5,000 kiaks. And again, petrol prices has shot up by 57%. The prices of basic commodities have gone up by 57%. Not mine, these are information from the Myanmar's ministry, because again, this, this we say that there's a Western slant to it, or anti myanmar So again, the economy is under a lot of crisis. Along with this, if the economy is in such a manner, and when we see that there's a crisis in the economy, the elites start to leave. And this is exactly the case in case of Myanmar, where the elites, the, the ones who are super connected, the ones who are former Tatmadaw, or again, business cronies or business associates of Tatmadaw, now, there has been a mass exodus. 80% of the wealth of the elites have left the country, according to sources inside Myanmar. Where has the wealth gone to? Dubai, Singapore, Thailand, and surprise, surprise, British Virgin Islands. And again, over here, if you look into Thailand, for example, the second largest foreign buyers of condominiums within the kingdom are basically the Myanmaris. The Chinese are number one. That only goes to show that there's a great degree of uh, lack of confidence in Myanmar. But all said and done, Myanmar's economy, which has contracted by 18% in 2021, is supposed to grow by 3% this year, according to World Bank's predictions. World Bank is not a soothsayer, and it's not always correct. But one of the reasons why the economy has revved up is because it has substantial foreign direct investment coming from several countries, which has already been mentioned. Number one, China. Number two, Singapore. Number three, Japan. Number four, South Korea. And number five or six actually is India. So basically the ASEAN countries have been propping up Myanmar because of again, the abundance of resource riches. And of course, there's also thriving trade that Myanmar has in terms of weapons with Russia. But this has also given Myanmar some amount of cover. But for how long will this economy manage to grow with so much of difficulty and unrest remains to be seen? That takes care of the economy of Myanmar. Now comes the more important part, the economics of Tatmadaw. Because just like they used to say about Prussia, that basically in case of Prussia, it's an army with a state, not a state with an army. So Tatmadaw is basically an army with a state, which is named Myanmar, as the West call, likes to call it Burma in Anglosphere. But basically, Tatmadaw comes first. And its economic control of the resources is completely chiseled into the, into the Constitution. Let me give you a little bit of insight as to how strong the Myanmar's, uh, our Tatmadaw's control on the Myanmar's economy is. Now, if you look into this, 
It has been power since 1962, directly or indirectly. And during that time, it has managed to rack up $2 billion of arms worth of $2 billion worth of arms, which is acquired from various purchases from different countries and has 70 years of combating experiences. Now, based on official estimates, and you can only basically add on to it, is 13 to 14 percent of GDP. It is actually higher. For a case of reference, Bangladesh's GDP, the, the amount that we spend on defense is not even 1.5 percent. But then again, you have to understand, these are two countries with two different civilizational objectives. Myanmar follows military fiscalism, where the military or Tatmadaw comes first. Along with this, it generates substantial revenue from the Myanmar Economic Holding Limited, MEHL, and Myanmar Economic Corporation. And every stage of economic activity, they have their presence, from banking to insurance to tourism to hotels uh, to spa centers to jade mining. Uh, like oil and gas, each and every one of them is controlled by the Tatmadaw. Jet trade alone nets in billions of dollars for the Chinese, uh, sorry, for the Myanmaris, because the main export market is basically China. MEHL has netted between approximately, these are conservative estimates, $18 billion from 1990 to 2010. And the army stays in support because of this lush funds that they have, and they basically donate, or they basically make donations to Buddhist monasteries who are king makers over there, and also to basically the, uh, the intelligentsia over there. And the modernization of Tatmadaw has been based on the proceeds of these revenues that have come in. That takes us also, and again, where have they spent this money on? Tatmadaw, largely on arms, acquiring arms. And who are the countries who have been beneficiary of this largest of the Tatmadaw? Russia, China, India, Israel, and Pakistan. It seems our South Asian neighbors can agree on one thing, at least that's exporting or selling arms to Myanmar. Good for them. Now, that takes us to the third component. So how much time do you have? Another three minutes. Let me then just rush on to the narcotics trade. Narcotics trade is also a hallmark of Myanmar. And as we know, a fragile state can be identified by the preponderance of narcotics trade. The total value of the Mekong Delta drug trade is around $40 billion. And over here, Myanmar is the second largest producer of heroin the biggest producer of methamphetamine, methamphetamine, which is basically Yaba, or which is called Baba in our villages. I don't know why. And again, the, the Shan state has the biggest Yaba production factories in the world. The Northern War state, which is between the Shan state and China, has one of the biggest drug labs. So Myanmar can be accused of basically imposing economic warfare on us by basically displacing the Rohingyas and also narcotics warfare on us because increasingly Yaba and crystal meth are coming from Myanmar. So this has become a, a, a matter of national security. More so than perceived aggression on the border, this has become the biggest threat to our future, our youth's future, and our country's prosperity. What about the sanctions regime? Credit must be given where it's due. The United States of America can be faulted for many things, but it has taken the lead in terms of basically sanctioning uh, Myanmar's atrocities. And these are targeted sanctions. However, the sanctions are not working effic efficaciously because these are not, there are no secondary sanctions because there is concern about, uh, about basically adversely affecting the welfare of the ordinary people. So as a result, the net of the sanctions is not all pervasive. But there has been recent developments. Myanmar has been put on the blacklist of Financial Action Task Force, which will greatly impede uh, many of the revenue pro processing of the Tatmadaw and many of their banks 
like uh, Minma Bank and Ira Minawadi Bank, Inua Bank, they have been basically sanctioned. But there are some more banks which are also ripe for sanctions, which in due time I hope there is pressure. But why, are, why is Myanmar basically evading the sanctions? Again, China, India, ASEAN, Japan. And Japan has to be accountable for this because it is all with the West on many issues, but in this case, Japan has its own different philosophy. We might respect this, but then again, Japan, South Korea, for that matter, or for Singapore, though increasingly there's a, little, there's a little bit of distance between Tatmadaw and Singapore, these are the countries which are enabling cash flow. And as a result, the sanctions are not effective. And in order to move away from dollar-based transaction, because of the shortage of dollar, Myanmar has recently carried out basically uh, yuan-based transactions and also baht-based transactions with both Thailand and China. And they are also, because they have also fuel prices, they have decided to import subsidized fuel from Russia. And their, their payment will be in rubles. Now, the financial sector in Myanmar can collapse if there are far more targeted sanctions. But ASEAN countries need to step up the plate. And India also needs to show that its commitment to uh, rule of law, human rights, they must make good on this. And if China ever wants to be held a respond as a responsible power, then it must show greater concern for the plight and suffering of the ordinary Myanmar citizens. And that also includes the Rohingyas, no matter what definition they put on this. And if I basically wrap it up, it's just last one minute, one minute. last one minute. In recent times, we are seeing an interesting phenomenon. The National Unity Government's PDF are carrying out basically economic insurgency because there are two parallel gas, oil and gas pipelines. One is the Yunnan province, another one is the adjacent to the Thailand, uh, along the border of Thailand. Increasingly, PDF is carrying out attacks with the oil and gas pipeline in Thailand. You send a message that if you continue doing business with that murder, you'll be affected. But the interesting part is that whether it's Arakat Army, whether it's PDF, whether it's the KIA, all have been very averse from attacking Chinese installations because China is somehow acting as an intermediary with all those different groups also. And they don't want a disproportionate Chinese blowback. This is something also very interesting. And in recent times, military-backed conglomerates, uh, uh, phone towers, there's something called Mitel, which is one of the largest networks over there. And they work with, uh, they work, they're working with a Vietnamese military company, which is called Vietel. So the company is known as Mitel. In recent times, 359 towers have been felled specifically to send a message to Vietnam that, again, you should stop collaborating with this. So this economic insurgency is going to take, uh, is going to continue apace. And if, and what we have, and I'm just summing up in the last minute, what we have is in the urban areas, in the case of classic guerrilla warfare, the Tatpadao reigns supreme, except for a few places. But in the rural areas, in the villages, in the mountainous areas, the ethnic armed organizations and the PDFs are holding strong ground. But because of massive air superiority, as mentioned by Major Shahid, eventually these armed resistance groups will start tar targeting Chinese installations or Indian installations if push comes to shove. And with the great game of geopolitics coming in, the fragmentation of Myanmar may not be ruled out as a remote possibility. Thank you. Thank you, Pervez, for also giving us an insight into the Myanmar economy, both formal and informal. But a fact to note here is that the sanctions aren't really working, especially because of the fact that many of the interest powers who have imposed the sanctions are busting sanctions themselves. So Myanmar has economic contacts and cash flow coming from countries in Europe, countries in ASEAN, and certainly from India and China. So Myanmar is not in an immediate economic collapse stage. The other factor is that Myanmar has gone through 
a 40-year sanction before this sanction period. So they have got a tremendous amount of steel resilience that they have built for themselves. They exactly know how to live with sanctions. And since it is internally resourceful, so sanctions don't really bite in the manner that it bites in other countries. But closer to home, in Bangladesh, we are grossly worried about the large volume of drug trafficking that is now taking place between Myanmar to Bangladesh and through Bangladesh to other countries. The Rohingya refugees are becoming the largest number of drug mules. They are in the business of drug carrying as an intermediary and as direct sellers. We are now also keenly observing the involvement of Bangladeshis and the particularly Rohingya refugees in small arms trafficking. And certainly, a very serious threat that is already taking place is with the human trafficking that goes on from the Rohingya camps to the rest of the world and through the Rohingyas recruiting other human traffickers. So human trafficking is becoming one of the biggest problem and security concern for Bangladesh through the connections back to Myanmar. To understand the various issues of Myanmar and in particular Rakhine State, we must also understand the very strategic politics of corridors. Myanmar and particularly Rakhine is home to three major economic and strategic corridors. The first corridor that has already been implemented is CIMEC, China-Myanmar Economic Corridor, that comes up to Chukpu, and a bifurcation is going back to Yangon. Myanmar is also home to the BRI corridor. Of the six corridors of BRI, of which two are maritime corridors, one is running through Myanmar to the Indian Ocean, and it meets the economic entry point at Chakpu. Myanmar and Rakhine is also home to the future of the potential BCIM corridor. So the three corridors within Myanmar and within Rakhine, the CIMEC, the BRI, and the BCIM corridor makes Myanmar extremely important geostrategically to major powers, including China. So with that brief understanding, let us now open the floor to questions, comments, your observations. Please feel free to speak freely. We are talking here on Chatham House rules now. Please indicate if you want to ask a question, raise your hand. And when I give you the floor, please introduce yourself and briefly ask a short question or make a comment. Let me look around the room now before I give the floor. We will first go to Zahid, Group Captain Zahid at the rear. I'm Dr. Zahid Khan, uh, a Air Force officer. Uh, uh, thank you very much to the, all the panelists for a, a very nice and excellent presentation. I fondly recall my association with Major uh, Shahid sir, during our short visit to Myanmar, uh, in which we had the opportunity to meet the current uh, president, I think he was the okay. senior general at, at that time. So, the, uh, and later on, we, during my PhD, I, I did have uh, the opportunity to deal on this issue. Uh, one of my articles appeared in uh, Global Responsibility to Protect, uh, published from Australia. So, based on those knowledge, I have two uh, different questions. The first is, uh, uh, given that we have tried, uh, uh, we have not found much traction into the regional response to the Rohingya crisis, uh, most recently we have been uh, trying to engage the uh, multilateral approach uh, through the UN. Now, um, we know that uh, Myanmar has already secured uh, support from two permanent members, uh, evidenced by their voting. How do you think should our foreign policy uh, mm, instrument work to unhinge at least <coughs> China, at least China from that particular support uh, mm, uh, group of uh, Myanmar uh, in, the, in the call for 
assuming greater responsibility of regional uh, stability? Will it wait till this instability rolls into a civil war, as some of uh, the speakers have argued, uh, and it's in the verge of rolling into civil war? So the second part of the question relates to the civil war part, and this is more theoretical. As you know, uh, the, the greatest theory of uh, civil war, one of the greatest theory of civil war is greed, versus greed and grievance theory, espoused by uh, Professor Paul Collier. Uh, it is an empirical theory. It's, it's based on some studies of all the civil wars. How much does the speakers think that the civil war, or would be civil war in Myanmar, is driven by, will be driven by uh, greed or grievance? Collier, of course, finds greed has more explanatory power to explain civil wars compared to grievances. Thank you. We'll now go back to Brigadier Zaz. Uh, alaikum, sir. Brigadier General Zaz, former defense advisor. Uh, first of all, I want to thank the panelists for excellent deliberation. Uh, also, General Munir, sir, and Mr. Sovan for arranging is this roundtable discussion. Now, Myanmar, as a country, because of their military rule, uh, they are isolated from the world, and they are very strictly controlling the medias and the information is not going out from Myanmar. So far, my knowledge goes, I visited Myanmar as a military delegation, and also I served in Bandaban region. I want to give two examples. The recent violation of Myanmar uh, by their forces, the border shells are crossing the international boundary, coming to our territory, and they are giving an excuse that they are chasing the insurgents, I think that is not good enough. When we fought our insurgents groups in, back in 89 and 90s, none of our mortar shell crossed the border and landed on the other side. So we have followed that international rule. Now even the ambassador, they are called in the foreign ministry and given the complaint, but no significance changed. Very recently, Another shell landed up, and the small arms firing is going on. The people are leaving the uh, places, but why? Uh, previously, we never had a division and the Air Force base in, in that area. Now we have an infantry division in Ramu area. We have an Air Force base. So I don't say that we should go for a war, because we do not support that. But our activities, our exercise, we should be strongly dealing with this kind of violation Otherwise, Myanmar is not giving any importance to our foreign ministry's complaint. And what Myanmar is doing, since we do not have any access to their information, but um, I want to add with General Shahid sir that Myanmar is not, in, not only preparing to fight the insurgents, they are also equally preparing to fight the conventional war because they are developing their air power statistic source and the naval power also. They, they did not shift their capital from Yangon to Napito just for the sake of having a beautiful place. They have the military strategy at the back of their mind. And there is a saying that with the support of China and North Korea, they are developing their uh, nuclear power as well. So considering all these things, we should not be very com uh, complacent that they are only busy with their insurgents, but they are equally becoming a good, a strong military power and we should give very strong reply to their border violations. Thank you, sir. Next question from Mr. Rusht. Please introduce yourself. As alaikum. I am Abu Rusht, editor of Bangladesh Defense Journal. Uh, what uh, General Shahid uh, has told that Myanmar army, they don't have any, say, interest about external aggression or some sort of thing like that. My question is that if they don't have, why they to require multi-role fighters, SU-30. Why they have procured ballistic missiles from North Korea? Why they have procured submarine from China and India? These are all aggressive weapons. We don't have multi-role fighters. We don't have attack helicopters, but Myanmar, they have. They have the VVR missiles. VVR missiles are not required for insurgency operations. So they are increasing their military power continuously. And uh, from 1977, we have, what we have seen that they had, uh, say, they, they tried to 
create military problem with us thrice in 1977, in 1991, in 2008, and then if we just discuss not about Myanmar, about the implications for Bangladesh, just come to that point. How much effort we have to put there? They have pushed nearly one million, what Sarah said. And Brigadier Rezaz has said that, yes, these people are creating problem here. Though not in a, a, in a military, in social problem, there are drug problems, what Sarah said, human trafficking and others. But one thing is uh, important that this uh, one million refugees here, for them, for them, we had to raise what Sarah said, one infantry division that increase that has increased our expenditure, and by that, our intelligence agencies, our uh, uh, like DGFI, NSI, or law enforcement agencies, they are say uh, how much. Uh, I just want to know that how much they can go further. We have uh, uh, limitations in our resources. They are already bogged down. Uh, they have to look after these one million refugees. There are multifarious problems there. They have to look at uh, our securities. So if there is more incursions or more sort of some, something like that from Myanmar, uh, we have to increase our every uh, facilities. Uh, we, our expenditure will go up. How further we can go up? These, uh, these are putting burden on our shoulders. And um, uh, we are a peace-loving uh, country. But Myanmar, for Myanmar, we might have to go for more armaments. Uh, we have to go for more uh, expenditure sort of something. And another thing is that... that uh, 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 can you be brief, please? Uh, so yes. Uh, uh, to uh, General Shah, sir. Probably you know that the uh, Janta leader, General uh, Ming, he visited Russia twice in this year. He visited Russia in 2021 also. The Russian uh, Defense Minister, Sir, Mr. Sergei Shoigu, he visited Myanmar just before the coup uh, in 2021. The Chinese uh, Foreign Minister visited Myanmar this year. And uh, if you just see, if you just calculate, then what is your idea about it, sir? Thank you. First, um, Ambassador Shamim, please. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, thank you, Chairman, and thanks for inviting me to this seminar. Uh, I will just, uh, I'll be short, and I will uh, pick up uh, two or three points that I've gleaned from uh, the presentation so far. The first two points would possibly relate to the keynote presenter, uh, Jan Shahid. I just heard you saying that uh, it is unfortunate that the West do not see beyond Aung San Suu Kyi when they approach the, the issue of Myanmar. Who do you think they should approach? Do you think they should um, sort of adopt some kind of a conciliatory uh, attitude towards the military junta or any other political uh, quarters. I don't know of too many political quarters in Myanmar beyond Aung San Suu Kyi. Uh, the second one is uh, I was pretty much uh, amused and I felt much interested in your uh, assertion that Myanmar, in case of some kind of military clash with Bangladesh, probable or improbable, much of a um, strategic depth. I mean, this possibly could generate a very interesting discussion around this table and there are many former defense senior officials or you could have a different uh, a separate seminar on that. And number three would be uh, the our foreign minister's recent uh, remarks to the media after his meeting with the Chinese ambassador here that China will help in initiating the repatriation of the Rohingya refugees here. Uh, what would be your comment or anybody from the panelists at the head table? And the number four would be uh, the issue of small arms. I'm particularly concerned about this because definitely there is a, a conduit of trafficking of small arms from Myanmar into Bangladesh. And this is a serious issue. This is serious implication because these Small arms often go into the hands of not only criminal elements, but also sometimes political elements, you know. 
So I would suggest that the PIPS, which is, has now come to be regarded as a leading think tank in Dhaka, in Bangladesh, could possibly organize a separate seminar on the illegal trafficking of small arms. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Shamim. The next question is for Mayor Vice Marshal Mahmood. Thank Please you. introduce yourself. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. I'm here, Vice Marshal Retired Mahmood Hussain. I'm teaching at a university. I said I would like to thank all the speakers for giving a very comprehensive and a very intelligent overview of Myanmar's instability. I'll just add one or two points. Uh, why Myanmar is important for us? Myanmar is important for us because Myanmar is equally important for China. It is through Myanmar that China gets an access into the Indian Ocean. Now, if we look at the geopolitics of Asia and the Pacific, we find that almost all the states in the ASEAN contingent, in East Asia, Australia, and others, have serious concerns about China. It is only Myanmar home China can be friend. And if China wants to have an access, it is through Myanmar that China will have that access. And China will always make its that pado stronger and stronger so that, so that Myanmar does not fall apart. China has already got about three aircraft carriers, and it will roll out another two or three aircraft carriers in another three to four years. And then when those aircraft spout the seas, the waters of Indian Ocean, then China will be able to say that it's a power in the Asia Pacific. That is why, besides exploiting the resources of, resources of uh, what do you call it, Myanmar itself. And the other next important point is that uh, Myanmar is not militarily weak. Its military is battle hardened It has been fighting for the last 40 years insurgency. And fighting insurgency can be much more difficult than fighting conventional warfare. We have seen this in case of the United States fighting the uh, non-conventional war in Vietnam. Had Myanmar not been strong, then it would not have violated the airspace so many times, and we have never retaliated. So what are the implications for Bangladesh? For Bangladesh's implications is that Bangladesh must have a credible deterrence, military deterrence. At least it should be qualitatively and quantitatively strong enough to take on any kind of Myanmar's attack on the southern territory of Bangladesh. If they attack and if they occupy a portion of that land in the south of Bangladesh, neither India nor China nor any other country will come and help us in rescuing that land. This is the trick. Second, what is the implication? Implication is our relationship with China. And we must also remember that Bangladesh is a democratic country. Myanmar is not. For China to turn Myanmar into another North Korea in that region will not be a difficult task. Thank you very much. Thank you. We will now go to Aisha Kabir from Protomalo. Uh, I'd like to uh, address my question to Ummi Salma Tar Tarin. You mentioned uh, when you were talking that India has a lot of clout with the Western world where Myanmar is concerned. And so, you know, they could be like a conduit or mediate with the Western world and Myanmar. So since it does have so much clout, and since it's purportedly a friend of Bangladesh, couldn't Bangladesh, ex this is a well, I mean, often asked question, I know, but I think it can't be asked enough. Couldn't Bangladesh expect India then to mediate with Myanmar or put pressure on Myanmar about the Rohingyas, about the repatriation of the Rohingyas. And if it has so much clout, as you were mentioning, that it has clout with the West too, where Myanmar is concerned, then why can't we expect that from India as supposedly our friend? Thank you, Aisha. We'll now go to Tanveer from Department of International Relations, Dhaka University. Uh, good morning. Um, I'm Tanvir, I'm a lecturer of international relations from University of Dhaka. So I believe a little, such, certain things need to be decluttered before we go into this uh, national unity government and how we might respond to this issue, right? So uh, intersection of geopolitical and geoeconomic interest is what led to the policy congruence that we see both in India and China, which led to them both propping up the regime in Burma. If we look at recent past, then I believe Indian official uh, development assistance to Burma has crossed in the last few years more than what they previously were. 
and China has been doing that as well. Both of these countries at the same time are maintaining links with the national unity government to keep up a hedging approach to this issue. They want to bet on which horse wins the race. So that is something we need to see. However, there is a catch-22 situation regarding this. If West decides to side with the national, start supporting that, India would also be forced to do that because nobody wants to lose on the lucrative trade routes or the routes that they both have access to their both respective, restive states or district provinces. That is number one. Second, in regards to um, Bangladesh and especially in regards to the geopolitical realities, we need to understand that Bay of Bengal is structured like a funnel and Bangladesh being at the top of the funnel has a commanding geographical position in this regard. However, Burma did not previously have the capabilities to affect our eastern sea lanes of communication that goes near the Burmese border through the Malacca Straits and to China and East Asia. They currently do with their acquisition of submarines from both China and India. And with the recent acquisition of frigates with North Korean support, they are able to do that as well. So we are gradually losing out every inch of the advantages that we had for the previous decades. Unless and until Bangladesh decides to wake up to the reality, sitting on the fence has never been helpful to any particular countries. That's number one. Secondly, given the fact that countries like Bangladesh lack strategic depth to begin with, we cannot have buffer states or we do not have the um, luxury of geographical space to trade for time, our strategies need to be congruent with the strategies of similar countries like Israel or Singapore, who follow this deterrent posture. I don't believe we can have a quantitatively advantageous position in terms of deterrence, but a qualitative approach to deterrence is something that we, that we probably should look forward. Two squadrons of typhoons or rafals, for example, would be much more effective than three or four squadrons of sukhois, which we might not be able to afford, perhaps. So there is a lot of ground for Bangladesh to improve its position regarding this. How we approach that is a soul-searching position that Bangladesh needs to take. Thank you. Thank you, Tanvir. Next question from Ambassador Shahid. Thank you, Chair. Well, uh, uh, having heard uh, all the speakers, uh, the questions, and uh, also uh, from the floor, uh, the subject we have is, uh, I will not go into detail, but how does Bangladesh is implicated uh, to the instability in Myanmar? If this is the main issue we are discussing, I think it is, uh, uh, big concern for Bangladesh because uh, I, I will not again dwell in, on the issues which already have been discussed. Question is, uh, Prime Minister, during her recent visit to New York, she highlighted that, the, uh, that during the last five years, not a single Rohingyas have been repatriated. This is a big concern. In, despite she has taken this with the international bodies, uh, the United Nations and other agencies, um, and uh, nothing has worked out, including the regional countries. Now the question is, uh, this has led to, to many other implications, uh, but Bangladesh has to maintain good relations with all its neighbors, and Myanmar being one of the closest neighbor, uh, General Shahid mentioned that uh, they are very inward looking and they, they have their own inward problem which needs to be tackled first. Uh, but uh, if history goes, I uh, served in Thailand, they totally ransacked their capital, uh, Ayutthaya, and burnt the whole capital. So they moved to today's Bangkok is, is the new capital which emerged out of the... So there was a, a sort of hate-hate relationship once upon a time, but now I think uh, Thailand and Myanmar maintain love and hate relations. The Thai government has also developed road communication into, into uh, Myanmar, which uh, we are also working towards it to link up with that particular road. Even we have discussed this with China, but I think, uh, I think still a lot to be done in this area. Uh, we have a, a good potential of increasing our bilateral trade with, with Myanmar. I think despite our issues on the Rohingya, I think our trade is still continuing. Uh, if we see from, from the media, a number of things are being imported from uh, Myanmar. So this is a positive site for Bangladesh. But uh, uh, we have seen that the three important players, as, as the speakers mentioned earlier, that be that China, India, Russia, they, they have to maintain their own interests 
with Myanmar. This is the biggest country in the, in the Southeast Asia region, uh, the size-wise. And uh, I will again not go into the potentials it has. Uh, these problems are there uh, from, from beginning. But Bangladesh, through its uh, strength, uh, Bangladesh is also a, a, one of the previous speakers who mentioned this is a country which is hardened, uh, battle hardened, and is continuing you know, its own internal wars for years together. But I think Bangladesh has gone through uh, also a liberation war. Bangladesh uh, was not prepared, but it could handle the war. But I think we need not discuss the war issue because already this Ukraine-Russia war is giving a big headache not to, to the entire world. We don't want to invite another headache for ourselves. But I think there, there should be uh, better ways to resolve than to, to think about how strength can be matched with strength. Strength has to be shown, but it need not be immediately put into action. This is my suggestion. Thank you. Thank you. That's exactly what Tanvir was trying to convey to us, that we need to build up a qualitative and quantitative deterrence. And I think that's the way to go. Our next question is from Mr. Tari Dussain, the former Foreign Secretary. Uh, thank you. Uh, I will very briefly touch upon a uh, number of issues and uh, then stop. Um, first thing is that neither bilateral approach nor a multilateral approach is going to send bank the refugees. It is not going to happen. Because of the limitations of the UN system, the multilateral will not work. And Myanmar has no intention of taking them back. It's plain and simple. So these are the two problems that we have. Um, so how to send them back? Now, as we are discussing about the geopolitical and geoeconomic issues, the thing is that for the big players, it is more for the strategies, et cetera, et cetera. But for us, the problem is much more practical, much more day to day. We are having a huge community of uh, Rohingyas, and which is increasing every day also, and creating all sorts of problems for us. A short uh, stay and then going back would have been completely different from what it has turned into now. Um, what we can do then? I think there are a few things that we could uh, think of. One is uh, the issue has been raised, contacts. It seems to me that we have hardly any contacts with any party who can be, who are relevant here. We have some formal contact with the military regime, with the government, which has turned, and then since the coup, basically it has come down, the level of contact has also come down. Um, the NUG is not going to win tomorrow and form the government, in my opinion, but then I think it is important that we have a contact. I don't know if we have clandestinely, but even if it is clandestinely, we need to have a contact with the NUG, because NUG is the only organization which has so far recognized the Rohingyas as Rohingyas. Nobody else has done it so far. The Arakan army has become a very important factor. Again, I would say that uh, well, the Arakan army was very happy when the military crackdown on the Rohingyas took place. They supported it. Yes. One. Second, they are overtly and uh, they are a diehard anti-Muslim entity. This is also a fact. But still then, I personally believe that uh, at some level, of course not official, we should have contact with the Arakan army also because they are an important player. We cannot ignore them. Um, they have made sort of an offer that Bangladesh and the Rohingyas, etc., they should come to them for, and they will decide how they will be repatriated, etc. Well, there has been a proposal, but it has been, I would say, that, you know, uh, quite condescending sort of thing, which normally cannot uh, happen between a, an organization and a sovereign country. But then, uh, I would still say we should have some contacts with Rohingyas. There is an important uh, distinction. Rohingyas are not the smallest ethnic community in, the, in Myanmar. It's pretty large. If you consider it to be 2.5 or 2.8 million in total before they were ousted. There are much smaller communities which have an insurgency, including the WA, which have the most successful insurgents, I would say the uh, WA state. They are a very small minority, of course. They are Han Chinese, so they have the support of China, etc., etc. But this is the only ethnic community 
which does not have an insurgency. They don't have arms in their hands. I do not consider the Arsa a reality. You know, it's either a myth or a, you know, it's a, maybe it's a farce sort of thing. They are actually, they have done nothing in favor of the Rohingyas so far. Um, I'm not saying anything, but I'm just pointing it out that such issues have never been resolved peacefully. And if there is a civil war, as has been indicated, or uh, as has been, uh, you know, thought by many here, a non-combatant will not get anything at the end of the civil war. I'll stop there on this issue. Um, a new wave of Rohingya refuses? No way. Our Western friends may be unhappy that we are not giving them shelter again, but then we cannot allow any more Rohingyas to come to Bangladesh. We have done our part, let others do their part. Um, Foreign Minister has said China will help about the Rohingyas. He says many things, but anyway, um, this is not going to happen. China, we have already discussed that they have tremendous interest in keeping Myanmar happy. So that's not going to happen. India is not going to help. Forget about those. Uh, think about some new strategy, new friends who might, in the long run, help us. I don't know who they are going to be. Uh, I think we should make one thing clear to China. Uh, we don't need to be appeasing all the time. China has interest in our country as we have interest with China. We should uh, clearly tell them that they should not build anything in Myanmar, in uh, Rakhine State, which have been untied through the process of ethnic cleansing. I am told that they are doing things like that. We should tell them that those places must be kept for these people to return, because they cannot stay forever in Bangladesh. I'll stop there, I think. Thank you, Tariq. But in the interest of understanding, what I would like to ask you, how do we stand diplomatically on the issue of Rohingya and our bilateral relationship with Myanmar? Are we diplomatically isolated? Shall I go back to uh, Frederick the Great? Short answer. Diplomacy without armaments is music without instruments. <laughs> Interesting points. And if there is a MOFA rep here in the audience, I don't know. Please take note of the interesting points that the Secretary has said. Uh, a point that I would like to point out is that please watch RSO. Very recently, the news that is coming out that the RSO is in the process of acquiring arms, which was not the case before at all. And if RSO is in the process of acquiring arms and in some places trying to confront the AA, then a new dynamics is again forming in Rakhine. And also with the relations that we have with the Rohingya issues. So it's a very dynamic process and a dynamic process of a conflict building. And one point that I would like to again emphasize, there is no military solution to the crisis. We firmly believe in BIPs that we must find out a diplomatic and a peaceful way of finding a resolution to the current crisis. At the same time, no diplomacy is diplomacy without deterrence. There has to be a biting power behind all diplomatic moves and maneuvers. We will now come to the last question, and I would like to offer the floor to anybody, our young friends from the university. Anyone? Thank you, sir. I am Musaddiq Ahmed, a student of East West University. Uh, we know in 1st February 2021, Myanmar military Santa take the power since then, Myanmar has been unstable. Recently, six mortar shells fired inside Bangladesh on Khumdum border in Bandarban. Can we consider it is the threat for Bangladesh? If it is, what are the possible things taken by Bangladesh to prevent the threat from Myanmar? Thank you. Thank you very much. Any last minute thought before I go back to the panelists? All right. We'll now again go back to our panelists and 
give each one of you two to three minutes to respond. We'll start with Shahid. Thank you very much. Uh, I will first uh, answer some of the queries um, on military. Uh, uh, as I was saying that um, Myanmar army has been, if you see their constitution, this is one word they've been using again and again, is called disintegration. So whatever is there, they're designed not to, I mean, uh, it was inward looking and all the, dis I mean, uh, uh, whole army is designed on infantry basis, number one. Number two, whatever the weapon system you are seeing, especially the air cover, all the airs what you are seeing here at this moment, recently uh, near our border, these are flown from either Miktila or Mandalay. So you know these places. Near our border, none of the air, there are two airfields, none of them can take either MiG-29 or a Su or JF-17. None of them have that capability. Yes, they have shifted some of their um, MI-24 or 35 and Ka-52. These are the two they have shifted. But why I say that they, they are not designed? Because they are purely infantry-based, designed to fight insurgency. And some of them, you will be horrified to know that some of the battalions, which I could not cover, that some of the battalions have got less than 20 to 30 percent of the authorized strength. So you can well imagine how they are, yes, there is a bit of formation called LID, Light Infantry Division, yes. They are the, you know, dangerous, you know, all those uh, ethnic groups who are uh, staying around the Myanmar, they really shiver whenever they hear that LIDs are coming because they really follow scorch art policy and they, I mean, they follow this uh, four cut policies and they really do the destructions of wherever they go. And number three is that a um, lot of are uh, asking about the shell landing on Bangladesh. Shell landing on Bangladesh doesn't mean that we should also start firing at that. Yes, we know what is happening on the other side there. Uh, though this is a little bit, I could explain on that, but then because of the time, I can't. But one thing which we can do is the posturing. That is very important. And this time, I, I'm sorry to say, previously, uh, our, as yeah, Vice Principal was there. Previously, they used to do, there was a certain thing called posturing. As uh, Sir was saying that in 78, we, didn't, we were very young, um, young nation, number one. Number two, we are also weak. But it is the Foreign Secretary at that moment and uh, DGBDR, Jan Atik and um, uh, Pratham Foreign Secretary. They are the ones who actually dealt with the whole thing. And one of the, our Joint Secretary who threatened, and that what it is, what international headline that he threatened Myanmar that either you take it or we're going to give them weapon. So, I mean, what I'm trying to say, posturing is very important, yes. Weapon is um, there, but posturing of the leaders and leadership is very important. And number three is that MED and PDF, what we are saying, that I'm sorry to say, these are the old wines in the new bottle. Who are our NUGs? Who are our PDFs? They are the MLDs, Aung San Suu Kyi's foot soldiers. And they are, I repeat, they are not integrated with the insurgents. If they had been with the insurgents, yes, I should have been worried that, yes, it's going to happen, it's going to disintegrate. I can assure you, since they are not integrated, and they also don't believe insurgents, they don't believe MEG and PDFs. So that portion of uh, civil war is not there yet. And another thing is that uh, Rus was saying about the ballistic missile, aircraft, and submarine. In fact, I'm not worried about their navy, their army. Yes, I'm a little bit uh, worried about air force because we used to have a air parity for a long time. But unfortunately, recently they have uh, uh, procured uh, Su-34, uh, JF-17. Then they are also uh, buying more. Uh, just uh, FT-2000 they have bought uh, last month. So this parity which you used to have, there, yes, it's broken. And yes, we are worried about that one. Our government must do certain things. But other thing that, uh, I'm not worried about uh, what, uh, how our submarines and all those, uh, I'm not worried about that one. And uh, in fact, yeah, but the picture um, on the map is only small portion. I mean, in all the Chinese main, uh, what is that called? You know, they had to uh, bypass Malacca Strait. For that one, it's not only Indian Ocean. They are also going to 
uh, Thai, state of Thai, and also there are two more accesses, which uh, I, I don't know whether you can see or not. From there, there are two more accesses on the map, which is also passing through Myanmar, or Myanmar is giving them access. So Myanmar is a $40 billion investment for Chinese just after Pakistan, um, China, Pakistan Economic Forum of Forum of $60 billion. And Bangladesh is $20 plus billion. So I leave it to your imagination where Myanmar stands, where we stand, where, I mean, who, who you should pick up. And uh, about the Rohingyas, I agree, well, sir, I fully agree with you that the Rohingyas and Arsas, Arsas are to me, they are low level drug peddlers, you know, and, and uh, extortionists. They are no insurgents, number one. Number two, yes, we should be worried about Arakan. This is a very big game is going on in Arakan. If Arakan army wins, I can assure you, it will have a tremendous impact on Indian interest in Rakhine state. Because the Kaladan project, which they, have, uh, the, which they are going to pro, uh, op, uh, get it operated uh, next year, I've got all the doubt, number one. Number two, in that one, that access Myanmar, Bangladesh, and uh, Myanmar, China, or Myanmar, India, all these borders are, will be uh, controlled by Arakan army. Just last month, September, Indian Sitwe councillor, he was saying in open forum that India is thinking of uh, discussing, rather negotiating with the Arakan army so that they can get access to this uh, Kaladan project. So uh, you can well Im imagine the uh, uh, Rakhine. There is a, um, there is a saying in, uh, in, 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 in uh, Myanmar, uh, especially with Bama, that if you see a snake and a Rakhine, who, whom do you kill first? They say, kill the Rakhine first, then go for killing the snake. Because Rakhine is very dangerous, you know. You can't believe them. You, you cannot, you know, tomorrow, today, if we help them, you'll find that tomorrow they are going to different things. So uh, that's all. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you, Shahid. Tareen, you have the floor for two minutes. Uh, thank you. <laughs> Uh, there was a question, uh, uh, how much uh, we expect India to play a mediator role in case of Rohingya refugee crisis. I think we cannot expect anything from India in this particular uh, case, in case of Rohingya repatriation, because India took, being a democratic country, being a historically friendly nation, India took a long time to even uh, call these people as Rohingyas also. Um, so from that aspect, we cannot expect uh, any kind of help other than just uh, diplomatic statements or just condemnation, those things. We cannot expect anything. Uh, I was basically trying to say that uh, India could be a mediating factor to reduce the amount of sanctions over Myanmar or to make it easier for uh, Myanmar or uh, 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 to uh, to, uh, to become economically uh, more uh, uh, effective uh, because uh, India has significant investments or interests as we discussed uh, in Myanmar and India will try to also pursue United States in a way that it do not look uh, uh, it, do, do not, it doesn't look towards Myanmar the US it doesn't look towards Myanmar from a just value based democracy point of view rather from a very geopolitical point of view because as India is shifting or US is shifting its attention towards in the Pacific Myanmar is in the center of in the Pacific and they will not want uh, China to take over Myanmar uh, 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 right at this moment uh, because China is despite about Myanmar. The way we cannot expect anything from India, we cannot also expect anything uh, from China uh, in terms of Rohingya repetition and uh, Sar has also told that uh, these are just, uh, just things uh, just to uh, say. And uh, there was a uh, question uh, also from uh, uh, Group Captain Yahid sir that uh, what are the things uh, we can do actually and especially to get to China or uh, how our foreign policy should work. Uh, I think we have to have a very pessimistic view about this. Definitely we need to concentrate or we need to focus more on 
um, having a strong defense diplomacy or developing a strong defense diplomacy right now to have more weapons or armaments or uh, uh, to, to have a, a compatibility with uh, the superior air power of Myanmar. Uh, but uh, definitely we cannot think of a war. We cannot go to a war with Myanmar. We cannot fall into the provocations by Myanmar. Uh, we need to think very clearly uh, whatever uh, things are going on inside the minds of Tatmadaw. And we need to act very consciously so that we don't do any mistake. And also in terms of uh, 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 there are people who might think about uh, suggesting the government uh, to recognize uh, UNG or to have a, a communication with the UNG. But that might prove a very risky undertaking for Bangladesh as well. Because if we just do such mistakes or if we try to maintain any kind of relation beyond that mother, in that case, there might be actually a second wave of, a wave of uh, refugees or Rohingyas. And there will be no one actually to help us, as we already um, know. So we need to, uh, definitely, we need to have a very strong diplomatic approach. But we have constraints because we know if we go to the UN, there is Russia, China, and the in intensifying ties between Russia uh, and Myanmar in recent years, and uh, this year as well, uh, 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 due to the visits of uh, uh, the military chief to Russia uh, to attend the Eastern Economic Forum in Vladivostok, and also China has told that we will support the Myanmar military at any cost at uh, whatever is the situation of the civil war. So from all these aspects, we don't, uh, we cannot expect that any prosperity or any progress will be made at the UN as well because of the uh, because of the veto power, veto of uh, from these uh, uh, states. Uh, so actually, what we can do, we don't have much to do apart from maintaining a very strong diplomatic uh, diplomatic uh, ties or networks uh, or utilizing our networks actually uh, we need to uh, I mean China might be thinking about their uh, image as an international player or as a responsible global player in many respects but I don't think in this respect or in this uh, regard China will uh, China is going to think about their prestige even they are bending their history uh, historical uh, uh, way of foreign policy of not interfering in uh, uh, other states' internal matters. They are bending this, they are this policy for Myanmar as well. So we cannot expect actually uh, uh, Myanmar to do anything else. So, uh, so uh, we, we need to uh, maintain, um, I mean, although we cannot expect a lot in the short term or even in the long run, but uh, what we need to do is we need to keep pursuing, we need to raise our voices wherever we can, and also definitely the deterrence we need to have, defense deterrence that I was telling that um, uh, we need to have a strong diplomacy as well. What went wrong with us that we are not finding anyone beside us? We need to have a very careful and critical observation uh, right now, I think. And uh, 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 and also, with regard to Rohingya refugees, Although we cannot do uh, uh, anything that might outrage the uh, Tatmadaw uh, so that they push out the remaining Rohingyas, uh, but still uh, we need to have a very strong um, uh, uh, um, deployment at the border so that we can also uh, seal all our entry points and we can have a realistic view rather than having a humanitarian approach in the coming days if anything. Um, any, anything occurs like us, uh, another wave of refugees. Thank you so much. Thank you, Tarim. The last comment from Pervez, please take two minutes. Last and also the least. Let me be, because I have been uncharacteristically very subdued because my topic was very boring, but now I have the chance to break free, at least for three minutes. What most people are trying to say, but because it's such a polite and august gathering, what we should do in Myanmar, we cannot discuss in this gathering. <coughs> Let's put it like this. What we need to do to convince Myanmar, whether it's on Suchi or Tatmadaw, to take the Rohingyas back, cannot be discussed in this, in the, within the confines of this hall, except for some in insinuations or winks or here and there. Pa our Pakistani friends in South Asia 
because Pakistan gained a lot of traction during the Soviet Union's invasion of Afghanistan or during the war on terror in case of General Pervis Musharraf. At that time, uh, President Ziar Rahman or President Pervez Musharraf or General Pervez Musharraf, whichever way you like it, was the West's favorite leader, most photogenic. Recently, President Biden has stated, again, it's not for me to pass any comments, General Biden has stated that Pakistan is a very dangerous place in terms of geostrategics. I'm paraphrasing, but that was the idea. And I, after years of service, and I'm even discounting President Ayub Khan's association with the West, what is the abject lesson? If you become a blunt tool for someone's disposal, whether it's China, whether it's India, or whether it's the West, or Russia, you will be used and you'll be discarded. Be careful for which battle you want to fight. I'm here to fight, defend every inch of territorial sovereignty of a country, but it's easy for me. I'm an armchair crusader. I won't be risking my life and limb. None of us will be. It will be our soldiers. So where will he create this deterrence? <clears throat> Military diplomacy, something which has been downplayed by the foreign ministry, has been made a uh, laughing stock, and we are paying the price. And the worst part is we say, oh, yes. And just before I end, there's also a reality check. Just calling Myanmar, Burma to please the West or get some contracts or consultancy is fine. But why shall I fight a battle if I cannot acquire territorial uh, possession of, uh, because see, talk of war is cheap. Right now, Bangladesh is also going through an econo <coughs> under severe economic crisis. Seven to eight hours of electricity cuts. We are negotiating an IMF uh, bailout package under environmental uh, concerns. And when our resources are so constrained, how can you afford military, and I'm all for military mobilization and for deployment, but you have to be very common. See, the Tatpata doesn't care about the people. It's a different country, it's a different people. It's a bummer majority hegemony over there. Our priorities are different. And we should have seen the Rohingya crisis coming because in the Economist had come up with the report that the Tatpada was planning a mass uh, genocide in 2015. What were we doing? Has anyone been held accountable in the responsible positions? These are questions, it's very easy to point at someone else. <clears throat> Why did we allow this to pass? Why did we allow our aerial superiority to be eroded? Why is it that today we have to say so many things instead of doing the only thing? And it's also our cultural arrogance because we only look to the Indians. We never considered about Myanmar, about Lukis policy. We inherited the superiority of an arrogance of the Calcutta Babus who looked down on the Burmese. We are paying that price. We should, uh, uh, we should ask those questions. The answers have not be straightforward. Thank you. Thank you, Pervez, uh, also for your very thought-provoking comments at the end. I shall not try to summarize because the discussion has been so varied and so rich. But I will only remind you of the certain key takeaways that I go from here. Issues have been raised about the Rohingya refugees. And the key takeaway for me is that we need to re-strategize. We are perhaps going beyond the humanitarian phase of the Rohingya refugee crisis. So we need to understand the complexities of long-stay refugees in a country. And that's a reality. Aspirations of repatriation can remain, but we have to cope with the realities of the long-stay and have strategies to cope with that. To understand the complexities of our bilateral relationships and the complexities of the potential security issues and even potential conflict, we have to have a very, very clear understanding of the state of the power play in the state of Myanmar. 
So Myanmar, in some cases, is a minority player. The majority player are the big players. The interests of the United States and the West, the Chinese interest, the Indian interest, and now beginning with the Russian interest. And that is a complex power play that we need to comprehend if we have to have a proper Myanmar strategy. We saw everybody mention that we need to increase our engagement with Myanmar, a country we have ignored historically. We have never focused sufficiently on Myanmar. So thereby, we have very weak capacity internally to deal with different issues of Myanmar. How many people do we have in the ministry who know the language of Myanmar? Almost none. And that kind of weakness goes back to all other sectors. We generally agree that diplomacy should play its role, but a diplomacy that really works and a diplomacy that is backed by deterrence, credible deterrence. In understanding Rakhine and in particular understanding Myanmar, we need to understand the issues of BRI, IPS or in the Pacific strategy, and the Indian Ocean in particular. It is all about the maritime strategy of the region and the global maritime strategy that is coming to the fore. And unless we understand that, we'll be missing out much of the meat of the whole story. And lastly, a point that was um, discussed in BIPS in the pre-discussion phase of this event, pointed out by our senior fellow Shafkat that the Myanmar strategy cannot be left to one single ministry in Bangladesh. It needs a combined, comprehensive approach so thereby, we might think of creating a task force under the PMO that has representation from all the key ministries that are involved in the response mechanism. It has to be economic response. It has got to include security response, humanitarian response, foreign policy response, and many of such responses. At the moment, we don't see that coherent strategy in Bangladesh. We are all working in our own silos. We have to go beyond that and go into a comprehensive strategy. So with that very small summary of a rich discussion, I would like to thank you all for your comments, questions, and with the very rich discussion we had today. And I now go back to our co-sponsor, our co-partner, Mr. Zafar Soban, editor of Dhaka Tribune, to give the final remarks. Uh, thank you very much, General. There's very little for me to add to your very comprehensive summing up of what has been a very rich and engaging discussion. I think what I would like to say is that um, in the last five years since the uh, influx of the Rohingya refugees over our border in 2017, I have uh, been part of or witnessed or have been in the audience of many discussions where we've talked about uh, the Rohingya refugee crisis, and of course this has been a subject which has been debated and discussed greatly both by the um, government, civil society, as well as the uh, diplomatic community here in Bangladesh and of course internationally. But I think what we've done here today is something which is done um, very seldom, which is really try to contextualize the Rohingya crisis within the, the, the context of the full picture of what is happening in Myanmar. And I think that's a discussion which doesn't really happen um, with sufficient frequency. And I think it's very important for us here in Bangladesh, as well as international players, to really see the full picture rather than, in fact, if we focus only on the Rohingya issue, we're really only getting a partial picture. And if you only look at a partial picture, of course, solutions will continue to elude us. Equally, what we have done today is look at the Rohingya issue within the geopolitical context of the other players who 
uh, influential who have a stake in what is happening in Myanmar. Specifically, we have mentioned the role of China and India and increasingly Russia. But what's also interesting is other um, ASEAN countries such as uh, Singapore, South Korea, Thailand also have their stakes and that has also come out um, fairly uh, elaborately in today's discussion. So I think what's very important here is this contextualization. One of the things which I think is very um, apparent to me, listening to the, the discussions, the very good um, presentations made by our three panelists, the interventions by uh, those in the audience, is when you look at things in the uh, when you contextualize the Rohingya issue within the picture of, uh, within the bigger picture of both the full uh, vision of what's happening in Myanmar as well as regionally and globally, we're very much on our own. And I think this uh, is really the fundamental crux of the dilemma Bangladesh faces is that no one, we really don't have any allies, there's no one to help us on the international stage, even countries, uh, this is to um, Aisha's question earlier, we think of as our great allies in other, uh, ostensible allies on other fronts have really not come to the fore. And looking at the, uh, it, 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 the, uh, at the bigger picture, the reasons for this become immediately apparent. At the end of the day, strategically, geopolitically as well as geoeconomically, Myanmar is a far more far greater import to these countries than we are. And you know, it's 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 a very simple calculus, I think, for them. Now uh, in conclusion I think one of the uh, uh, points which has been made is that the instability in Myanmar, which is now in fact has been building up steadily over the last several months and is really, you know, approaching perhaps a tipping point is in fact extremely relevant to the Rohingya situation and indeed our situation um, in terms of hosting uh, the Rohingyas and the crisis we face. There's a non-trivial possibility of uh, the entire country tipping into civil war, of um, complete disintegration, and that will in fact impact the uh, the Rohingya situation as well. And so this is something which we in Bangladesh need to be prepared for. I mean, there are tremendous risks associated with it, but um, uh, cue the comments made both overtly and also by suggestion from some of the panelists here and the speakers here, that may also be an opportunity for Bangladesh. Either way, whether it's a risk or opportunity, we need to be vigilant and we need to be alive to what um, the changing situation in Myanmar, uh, the impact that's going to have on our uh, issues vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the Rohingyas. And finally, and I think this is the point which many of the speakers as well as the panelists have made, is that what we really need is a far more comprehensive and coherent strategy for dealing with uh, not just, and in, 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 in this gets to the major point, not just the Rohingya crisis, but Myanmar is our neighbor. This is uh, you know, this is a, a country we share a border with, and it's quite clear that in terms of our diplomacy, it has been uh, criminally ignored and neglected. And we have focused on this very poorly, and as a result, we find ourselves in, uh, in, in the quandary uh, we face. We've really been um, sleepwalking, certainly historically over the last several decades, but even more unforgivably in the last five years, since the crisis has reared its head here in Bangladesh, we have done very little to um, really uh, put, uh, put our relationships and our communication and our understanding of, of Myanmar and what we need to do on the kind of priority footing that we need to do. So in conclusion, what's really necessary, I think, is for Bangladesh to perhaps stop sleepwalking on this issue in really, on, in a comprehensive way, uh, the general had mentioned that uh, perhaps what is necessary is a um, multi-ministry 
coordination to really deal with this issue. And as I've mentioned before, dealing with the Rohingya crisis means not just focusing solely on the Rohingya crisis in isolation. It actually means understand dealing with the entirety of Myanmar as our neighbor to the east and dealing with the entirety of Myanmar insofar is it is situated in global geopolitics, geoeconomics, and geostrategy. Thank you very much. Thank you, Zafar. This brings us to the end. So before we end, please join me in thanking our panelists for today for the excellent presentations. So once again, ladies and gentlemen, thank you all for being here today. We look forward to having you again next month for our joint event with Dhaka Tribune with on another key strategic issue which will be notified to you in time. Please join us for a cup of coffee outside. Thank you.